coming up on Network Africa. The United Nations calls for an acceptable election timeline in Mali as Sweden plans to withdraw from French-led special forces. The World Health Organization decries blockade of its efforts in sending medical aid to Tigray in Ethiopia. Plus, Uganda to destroy 400,000 unused COVID-19 vaccines. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Layo Adegoki. The UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres says he is working with the West African Regional Bloc, ECOWAS, and the African Union to create conditions that could allow Mali to adopt a reasonable position for a quick transition. According to Mr. Guterres, it is absolutely essential for Mali's military leaders to announce an acceptable timeline for civilian elections. He says he also hopes to speak soon the Malian government. ECOWAS has imposed tough sanctions on Mali after the military government announced the long delay to the elections that were originally planned for February. Now, this includes a range of trade sanctions and land and air border closures. The European Union on Thursday also said it would impose sanctions on Mali. In the meantime, Sweden has decided to withdraw its troops this year from a European Special Force mission in the Sahel region. According to Foreign Minister Anne Lind, Sweden will also review its UN contribution after the arrival of private Russian military contractors in Mali. The Swedish parliament approved the deployment of up to 150 soldiers to Takuba in 2020, and it has some 250 military personnel as part of MINUSMA. Takuba was established as a partial successor to Barkhane, France's counter-terrorism operation in the Western African Sahel region that French President Emmanuel Macron started to reduce from its initial 5,000 strong force. It comprises some 14 European countries which provide special forces logistical and tactical support to work alongside regional forces for targeted operations against Islamist militants. We have already decided that this year we will withdraw the, the force of Takuba. The, the, the question is, how do we do with MINUSMA? Uh, and two things are very worrying in Mali. One, that we now uh, know that there is a Wagner Group, which is a private company but mainly with also with uh, uh, Russian private um, uh, soldiers and security personnel. And if they have uh, a stronger and stronger impact, then it will be not possible to continue with those large number of troops from us. And we have been very strong together with other troop givers in this. And the other thing is that the 18 months the transition government said there will be democracy in election. They have now proposed five years. That is unacceptable for us, but especially ECOVAS has put strong sanction on, on Mali. We will discuss this in our parliament on Tuesday. I and the four, uh, defense minister will be there. And of course, it will have consequences. Despite the World Health Organization's efforts in sending medical aid to Tigray, the body has been blocked from sending medicine into the region. Dr. Tedros Ghebreyes has made this known, adding that it is so dreadful when a government is denying its people for more than a year food and medicine. Northern Ethiopia has been beset by conflict since November 2020, when Prime Minister Abiy sent troops into Tigray after accusing the region's ruling party of attacks on federal army camps. No to the this region has been under siege for more than a year. Imagine a complete blockade of 7 million people for more than a year, and there is no food, there is no medication, no medicine, no electricity, no telecom, 
no media, nobody can report. And when there is no telephone, I think accessing families is difficult. No cash, no bank service. And imagine the impact of all this on health. Lack of medicine has direct impact and people are dying. But lack of food also kills. And on top of that, daily drone attacks is killing people. From our side, we have been trying, from WHO side, trying to have access to send drugs to Tigray and the other affected areas by the conflict, Afar and Amhara regions. We were permitted to send medicines to Afar region and Amhara region while we were not allowed to send to Tigray region. We have approached the Prime Minister's office, we have approached the Foreign Ministry, we have approached all relevant sectors, but no permission. So there is a blatant measure which has been taken, that's blockade and siege, for more than a year, 7 million people, and since especially July, no medication was allowed from WHO, none whatsoever. Zimbabwe's President Emerson Mnangagwa has handed over power to the Vice President for three weeks. This is because the President begins his annual leave on Friday. Information Ministry tweeted the statement from the government handle saying that President Manangagwa's vacation runs until the 5th of February 2022. In the meantime, Vice President Constantino Chiwenga would be acting president during this period. Now to a rather grim story, a 16-year-old South African schoolboy shot dead a classmate after an alleged quarrel before taking his own life. Officials say the two were grade 10 pupils at the Lesiba Secondary School in Davyton, Hauteng Province. The shooting is said to have taken place on Wednesday inside the school as classes resumed for a new academic year. Police are now investigating the circumstances surrounding the deadly incident. In the meantime, mental health officials have been sent to the school to counsel those who may have been affected. Well, joining us now for more on this is our South Africa Bureau Chief, Betty Debia. Hello, Betty. This is quite a tragic and unexpected story. I mean, a 16-year-old shooting his fellow classmate and then taking his own life. What is the situation at this time in Lesiba Secondary School? Well, it's unfortunate given that it happened on Wednesday, which was the very first day of school, uh, the 2022 academic year. So um, uh, uh, as the member of the Executive Council um, for Education, uh, Panyaza Le Sufi has been speaking to the media. He's saying that the psychosocial relief uh, has, or, or officials have been deployed to the school to speak to the friends of, of the two deceased persons and also um, the other pupils who may have witnessed some of these things. Uh, it's not a first. Uh, also on Thursday, we had another incident where a uh, general assistant in a school in Soweto was shot dead. Some of these incidents are usually recorded in, in different provinces in, in the country. But uh, having a, a pupil do this, we, we often hear of uh, stabbing incidents. And there was a time the government was considering having metal detectors. Uh, now we, we got some clarity that uh, the incident happened outside the school premises, but the quarrel actually started when school day started. Uh, and then they took it out. Then uh, uh, this pupil, who is 16 years old, uh, shot the, the fellow pupil and then shot himself. And the, the police is also involved at the moment, speaking to the, the friends of these two people involved to ensure that there is no reprisal or revenge attacks, you know, among the, the friends as well, if it was a gang issue, so you don't have further loss of lives uh, and, and things like that, uh, situations like that. So it's just general counselling and, and the police, then the officials for community safety, uh, are there working together to ensure that incidents like this are reduced. But they're often reported. Some 
come from outside, probably a husband or a wife. Most of the time, it's a husband who walks in, shoots his wife, and walks out of school. Uh, and the, for the pupils, most of the time, we hear of stabbing incidents. Uh, uh, that's the situation. But, but um, they're talking to the pupils now to, to calm them down, ensure that no further lives are lost. So, well, now you're saying, you know, the shooting took place outside the school, even though the quarrel started from inside the school. I think many would be thinking, how was he even able to bring in a weapon into the school premises? I mean, what does this say about the security measures that are in place to keep students safe? Um, it, it's been a concern for, for government and school officials. Uh, as I said earlier, uh, there have been incidents that have happened where you, you, there were considerations, you know, of of, of uh, putting in metal detectors and things like that. But you know, you don't even want to intimidate or terrorize students by having a situation like that being the norm. And again, recently, you know, the COVID protocols have seized the attention of the authorities, ensuring that people are safe, um, safe from COVID. Uh, the health uh, safety protocols. So these are some of, and no one would have expected a situation like this, uh, a, a gun into the school or bringing it into or outside the school for them to to now, you know, turn it on, on one another. Uh, so it's a failure, failure probably in in monitoring a situation or diffusing uh, a, a situation that could have that that went on to become uh, uh, this bad, uh, fatal like this. So it's a failure probably for, for the authorities, but they're calling on the, the, the communities to get involved, the family units as well, as well as community members and the police to support government and the Department of Education to ensure that things like this are curbed. Well, I can, I can imagine the reactions that have been trailing this, I mean, from families, even the fellow school children and the parents. Of course, it's a, it's, it's a traumatizing kind of story to, to be talking about uh, and, and involving children. So people are worried about this happening and this replicating itself elsewhere where people uh, disagree and, and take it further. Uh, the the, the governors who have spoken about it are saying, look, it's okay to disagree, but you can end it there or resolve it rather than resorting to weapons. But then this is a very violent uh, country uh, where, where gun violence, among other types of violence, is quite rife. Um, police is quite stretched in the country, and they're doing their best. Even, even recently, the police minister was talking about police killings, where they go to uh, attend to situations and they get themselves killed as well. They just buried one or two uh, uh, officers not, uh, within last week as well. So it's, it's quite a violent country, and it's, it's a situation that uh, requires much attention and, and other more measures to ensure that um, uh, it's reduced or it's curbed. Indeed, a situation we do not hope to happen again. Thank you so much, Betty, uh, South Africa Rear Chief. Thank you very much. Thank you. Still to come on the program. Nigerian startup applications help to fight the scourge of fake pharmaceutical drugs. That's on our Africa Tech segment. Please stay with us. Welcome back to the program. Uganda is set to destroy 400,000 unused coronavirus vaccines, which had been in supply for use in the north of the country. But most of the unused doses are Moderna and AstraZeneca. According to Uganda's media, local media, the batches are thought to have been expired. And this comes as the country has reached less than half of its target to vaccinate 22 million people. Well, the the local media also attributes the low vaccine uptake to unproven health myths in the country. Nearly 100 Rwandans who fled to an island in Lake Kivu in neighboring Democratic Republic of Congo to avoid getting COVID jabs have been repatriated to their country. However, two people are said to be missing from the group of 101 
Rwandans and a search operation is on the way. An official of the island says that the authorities were able to negotiate with the Rwandans to return the people home. Meanwhile, Governor of Rwanda's Western Province says he has no knowledge of the fleeing Rwandans and it's not clear if authorities were involved in their return. Last week, Burundian authorities expelled more than 10 Rwandans who had entered the country to escape mandatory vaccination back home. Rwandans must be vaccinated to be allowed to use public transport to go to bars and restaurants or to attend public events. Meanwhile, Rwanda has lifted a ban on concerts under its new coronavirus regulations. The ban was effected in December after a rise in COVID-19 cases attributed to the Omicron variant. The cabinet has resolved that concert organizers must seek permission 10 days before their event. The concert tickets should be sold online and the recommended capacity is 50% for indoor venues and 75% for outdoor those attending concerts must also the concerts must also show a proof of vaccination. Theaters and cinema halls have also been allowed to reopen, but at 50% capacity. Welcome to our Africa Tech segment. To fight a flood of fake pills in Nigeria, startups are deploying barcodes and apps so that consumers can authenticate their pharmaceuticals. The prevalence rate of fake drugs in the country is higher than the global average, and this contributes to the deaths of thousands of children and adults annually. At the Biofilm facility in Lagos, Chief Executive Femi Shuramekun shows how you can check these pharmaceuticals are the real deal. Via a barcode and a phone, he can authenticate the drugs. And that's important in Nigeria, where the prevalence of fake medicines is higher than the global average of 10%. In 2009, Biofirm had their anti-diabetic prescription drug, glycophage, counterfeited in the market causing a decline in revenue. After the experience we had, and we were able to mitigate that experience using technology, we decided that all our products would, was going to have it, uh, so that we do not wait till when it is counterfeited before we protect the patient, which is primary to us. To fight a flood of fake pills, Nigeria's National Agency for Food and Drug Administration and Control, NAFDAC, has partnered with startups to create stickers with unique codes. Manufacturers and distributors attach them to boxes and sachets of drugs. Consumers use apps to scan and confirm authenticity. This is the Check It app. Uh, One of such apps has been developed by Check It Technologies. Founder Dari Udumade says incentives are used to encourage the consumer. What we discovered was that people don't necessarily scratch off labels on products, which is why we went off with the idea of, you know, putting more like an incentive on the sticker labels through a scratch verify win model, printing that exactly on the sticker label. So when a consumer sees the sticker label, has, a, has the idea that it's signed a chance of winning something, and that can basically divert them towards authenticating the, that product. And we've seen that work for us, right? Over 60% of our labels get authenticated in the market. $4.8 billion worth of fake drugs have been seized by NAFDAQ in the past three years, says the Director of Investigation and Enforcement, Kingsley Geoffo. He said the use of apps is boosting confidence in the pharmaceutical sector. That has boosted the confidence of people in this. So um, modern technologies have really helped so, but for that, people would go and, uh, you know, imagine some of the drugs in, the, in, in time past that people will ingest without, you know, that technology. So the technology has really helped. Nigeria, with a population of about 200 million, has had fake and substandard pharmaceuticals influx into the market for decades. <laughs>
Well, let's check in with the Africa Cup of Nations taking place in Cameroon. Soccer fans covered with full body paint to show support for their teams are out in their numbers in Yaoundé. And if they can't attend games at the stadium due to strict COVID measures, they can always watch the games on large screens in fan zones. Painted from head to toe with colors of the Cameroonian flag, Ngando Pickett dances his way to the Olembe Stadium, followed by his marching band to support the Indomitable Lions as he took on Ethiopia on Thursday. Despite the strict COVID rules to enter the stadiums during the Africa Cup of Nations and fears that separatist militants might disrupt the competition, the group of supporters following Pickett say that soccer unites the people of Cameroon, so they're not worried. Soccer unites the people of Cameroon when there are problems. When there is soccer, everything stops, and everyone is behind the Lions and happy to support the Indomitable Lions. And we know that we will win in the end because we want to keep the Afghan here. Groups of supporters from other parts of the continent have also been rehearsing their moves in order to support their national teams, despite a few absentees due to the pandemic. Alice Kone, a Burkina Faso supporter, says the team still needs support, so they're doing just that despite a diminished group. If I think, uh... We have to say that COVID impacted the team a lot, because our mascot, our mama, a lot of supporters did not come. But despite this, we're trying to make do. We know it's not easy, but we try to make do so we can support our national team to help them win. But since the start of the competition, most games have been played in near-empty stadiums, with many fans opting to either stay at home or enjoy the celebration in packed fan zones, which do not require a vaccination certificate or a negative test to enter. A lot of people wanted to go to the stadium because the information was that the vaccination was compulsory to get in. A lot of people preferred to stay at home and watch TV. Many don't know what it is. They don't know what will be injected in their bodies. But a number of people wanted to go to the stadium. That's why we have empty stadiums. It's the truth. In the end, Vincent Abubakar and Kyle Tokwe Kambi scored twice each as host Cameroon put one foot in the second round of the Africa Cup of Nations with a thumping 4-1 victory over Ethiopia, sending a crowd into a frenzy. All around during day, small groups of supporters are watching their teams compete, whether in a packed square or in a small neighborhood shop, just like Senegalese supporter Tuba Fall, who swears he will attend his team's next game in Bafetan. And as the Super Eagles of Nigeria get ready for their second Afghan match with Sudan on Saturday, goalkeeper Maduka Okoye is aiming for all three points against Sudan in Nigeria's second group game at the Africa Cup of Nations. Okoye kept a clean sheet as the Eagles began their Afghan campaign with a 1-0 win over Egypt on Tuesday. He believes Nigeria can beat any team and will go all the way to the final. Yeah, first of all, I'm looking forward for, for three points. And then uh, a clean sheet is, is, is always good. It's always a good sign of, uh, of good defending and, uh, yeah, compact team. So, uh, yeah, it would be good. Uh, from behind, I saw a very, very good, uh, a very good team from, uh, from us, from the Super Eagles. And uh, I think we performed great, um, collective. And uh, yeah, we need to we need to stick on on, on, on this level, and then uh, I'm sure that we can uh, yeah beat everybody. We set a, a high bar, so we need to stick to that, and we we we, we have to keep on our on our minds that um, yeah this was now the first game, but uh, we have six more to go, so uh, we need to stay focused and uh, work hard. I wish the Super Eagles all the best in their game. That's it on the program today and for the week. Thank you so much for always being a part of it. I'm Layo Adegoki.